Mary's Place believes that no one's child should sleep outside, and we do that through prevention work, outreach work, and shelter services. We serve some amazing women and families in our community, our neighbors, that really are at risk of losing their housing or have already lost their housing. I've been at Mary's Place for about two months, and I have a three-year-old daughter here with me. Working with our families is all about restoring that light and help and healing and hope ahead. And at every point of every service we offer, it's about being able to be connected, to have that accessibility to technology and Wi-Fi, to make sure you can get your needs and your goals met to keep marching towards that house and that dream you have for you and your family. Connecting people to the internet and the resources that being online provides is a critical priority for Comcast. And working side by side with Mary's Place, we're seeking to advance digital equity and workforce development for those that are transitioning out of homelessness. The Mary Place internet is really good. I use it for virtual doctor's appointments. It's really helpful. There's a lot to navigate, especially when your um, home language may not be English or you've never really touch the computer, but we have um, great access through the Lift Zone. Our Lift Zone initiative currently provides free Wi-Fi to over 90 community center locations across Washington, like the one we're in here today at Mary's Place. One of the things that I have loved is that since getting the Lift Zone, there has been equitable access. If you need to get online to get a food handler's permit to work a job, it's right at the tip of your fingers. Comcast has been by our side almost every step of the way, providing that connectivity, that accessibility to technology inside every shelter. It has been an incredible, important, um, critical relationship for us. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, it's always exciting to be at a civic cocktail um, hosted by City Club. Um, as Alicia said, my name is Lauren McGowan. Um, and I am thrilled to be here today, um, both with two women who I've long admired um, and who I believe are just um, on the forefront of ending homelessness in our community, um, but with all of you, many of whom I've known for a long time, um, working in different capacities in this really important work. Um, as we start Women's History Month, I think it's really important for us to think about the fact that um, far too many moms and grandmas and aunties and young girls are experiencing homelessness on any given night. It is absolutely unacceptable. It is something we can absolutely solve. And um, tonight we're gonna hear a little bit from two uh, leaders in our community who I think um, not only have been doing this work with fierce determination for a very long time, um, but have new ideas about how we can do it in even stronger ways. So I'm delighted to be here with uh, Marty Hartman, the executive director of Mary's Place. Um, and Janice Hardy, the regional director of family and related services at the YWCA. Um, and um, both of them um, have just a ton of experience in this area and I'm excited for them to talk to us a little bit um, about the work. So, so Janice, I wanna start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your organization addresses housing and homelessness, particularly for women? What's unique about your approach? And tell us a little bit about what's working. Well, the YWCA is a real big tent. I call it wraparound services. Everything you can think of, we do. And I do think the approach is to really meet people where they are. We really know that Data shows who is furthest away from opportunity and access. So what we do is zero in on that information to figure out what our approach may be. Primarily right now, the data is showing that African Americans are the furthest away from opportunity and access. So what we're doing is really working with folks that look like us, that is furthest away, trying to get access to services. So we meet people where they are, we have those honest dialogue, I call it real talk. We love real talk. Uh, yeah, that we can really get to what it is necessary to move families forward, and single adults. It's important that we understand the dynamics people are going through. There's no book to this work. Uh, you know, they always say, go get the MSW, bring them in. 
Well, the MSW don't always know everything. So, you know, for me, it's, it's really being a community member, getting the community involved. You know, it's not just the organizations doing the work, it's our local churches, recreation centers, Seattle Police Departments, hospitals, Child Protective Services, all of these particular pieces, we all need to work together in order to tackle what is needed to move families and women first. Thank you. Marty, same to you. You've been with uh, Mary's Place for a long time now. Tell us about what the organization is doing today um, and, and how, how women are uniquely impacted. Yeah, you bet. Um, Mary's Place really is standing in the gap from that moment a family is about to lose their home or has lost their home. And we also serve women at our day center. That's the way we were founded over uh, close to 30 years ago, right? A, a tiny women's day center by Reverend Jean Kim, a little firecracker. Uh, if you knew her, social worker turned minister and really just out of the love and um, and really the grief and the loss that she had experienced over losing her own child needed a, a purpose higher than herself and started uh, the Church of Mary Magdalene, which then became Mary's Place. And uh, we still have that day center going with a robust group of women every day. Um, and we share a lot of the same women. I really think it's funny over the years, we know each, all the women, we could go into each other's places and know each, uh, the ladies that are there and uh, but just this sense of community and belonging that she developed is what we've carried through and and have brought tried to bring that to families um, I think most people think that women and families first of course there's no children sleeping outside that they would get the beds first before others and that's not our world that's not our community in fact we have to um, have a vulnerability scale and we have to pick and choose who gets the bed tonight do you know who we pick? Children zero to two because of the most lifelong trauma that they face outside. We choose medically fragile children because without shelter, we know they will die. And then we choose families that are fleeing domestic violence because we know that there are just not enough domestic violence beds and they are at risk and danger. But that leaves so many more outside and what Mary's Place is simply trying to do with our community partners as we work together is to bring them inside and get to know Child Sleeps Outside. We have five family shelters spread across King County as far north as Kenmore, as far south as Burien. We have 720 beds tonight. From, and we bring in uh, whatever your family looks like on the outside, we want to bring them inside, right? So if you're, you know, if it's a multi-generational family, families with pets, moms with kids, dads with kids, two-parent families, everybody has a place uh, to call home at Mary's Place for now, except there simply aren't enough beds tonight. We partner with the Y and all of the other family providers. Well, there's only six of us in total that do shelter in King County, but we work together uh, and we run the family shelter intake line. And that's where all the families call every day uh, looking for those beds. We hope to fill those beds by noon every day so families have time to get there. But the reality is about 20 to 30% of the callers every day will get a bed tonight. The rest are asked to sleep outside and to keep calling and to keep calling. It is heart-wrenching, it is heartbreaking, and it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, we also have an outreach center uh, at the Allen Family Center where really we have outreach workers. So those families that can't be served in shelter, we're out there uh, meeting them in cars. We're out there sleeping in the back of U-Hauls because it's cheaper to sleep in a U-Haul than it is to rent a hotel. They are sleeping if they have a car at the end of a quiet cul-de-sac. Uh, we are embedded in the hospitals with those medically fragile children because they know when that child's discharged, they have nowhere to go to get those follow-up chemo, dialysis, the next surgery, the next lab result. So we're working inside the hospital hospitals inside the clinics um, and all of that is based out of that outreach center in the Mount Baker neighborhood. Um, I'll say what is working? Did you ask? I did. Yeah. Well, what's not working is we don't I'm have enough I'm never going to get beds. a word in here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's not working is we obviously don't have enough shelter beds and we could never possibly build enough shelter to house them all. 
So what we've done is what a lot of what um, Janice is referring to is those innovative approaches, knowing what's working based on data, based on uh, best practices across the nation, implementing them, piloting them here. And two of those are the diversion approach, really using flexible funding to help move families into housing as quickly as possible when they're living unsheltered outside. And the other is prevention. And you'll hear a lot about prevention tonight because really keeping families in their hard-won homes is, the, is what we need to do to reduce trauma and the generational impact that children are facing. Mm. Marty talked a lot about um, babies being on the street, right? And we don't often think about that. Janice, I know that the YWCA also serves a lot of older women, um, folks who um, are, uh, you know, maybe have, don't have retirement savings, um, have lost family. Talk about some of the older, older adults that you're serving and what are the unique uh, needs that they face? Well, you know, we have our Angeline State Center and Knight Center and we see, before the pandemic, was of over 150 women a night. And these women come from all walks of life. You're dealing with uh, senior women, you're dealing with mentally ill, you're dealing with drug addiction, you're dealing with folks that are very, very fragile. We're seeing more and more 60 plus women coming into the shelter that's not able to get on the mat on the floor. There's a lot that's happening with them that doesn't allow them to do so. We do have some beds that we're able to do, but most of them are mats that we may have to stack up to be able to accommodate an older woman that may be on a cane, need help getting up, those type of things. Our adult senior women, we really don't have a lot of shelter to really make sure that our seniors are safe. There are more and more coming into the facility around them needing extra needs, more mental health, follow up, Where's their family? What's gonna to happen to them? Are they on social security? What are they getting to maintain? Why we try to work with the different apartment complexes that may consider taking seniors, that may have different ways in which seniors can live with caretakers and those type of things. So we do have a new and upcoming that I have seen, haven't seen in a long time called seniors. Um, you know, we are seeing day after day after day where we're getting calls, where hospitals are releasing seniors that we may can't even bring to the center because of their needs are so deep in terms of what they need to be able to move forward. That is another place where we're lacking in that area. It's remarkable to think about just the challenges that, that these women are facing. Marty, you know, a lot of the women coming to you um, have different experiences. Some of them are working, some of them fleeing domestic violence. Talk a little bit about the reasons that they are falling into homelessness and um, what do folks here need to understand about why somebody becomes homeless? Yeah, and I will say when we're working with families and moms, uh, what you see outside isn't necessarily who's showing up at our doors, right? Families are scared, they are frightened, they are hiding. They're afraid that their children will be taken because they simply can't provide in the way that they want to. And for most of these families, it's this one season of their life that they're facing. And right now, these parents are like, all of us reeling from the effects of the pandemic, right? Many of them, their jobs were cut. They had to stay home to do, to do remote learning. They didn't have childcare options. And now you're seeing huge rent increases with affordable housing units going up 18% over the summer. And that was enough to throw many of them into an eviction crisis, right? Uh, and then you see costs going up you know, diapers. I mean, look how much it, we couldn't even get formula and then the cost of having to buy formula. And childcare is so expensive, even if you can find it. And so our parents are doing everything. They are strong, they are resilient, they are courageous, and there is nothing they wouldn't do to meet the needs of their children, yet they are working so hard just to keep them together. And I don't, you know, can you imagine your, you know, your child being diagnosed with a, you know, a chronic health issue, Crohn's, uh, you know, diabetes that, that's out of control, needing a transplant. Uh, your, nobody plans for their baby to be born at 
30 weeks and be spent in the NICU. And so what do you want to do? You want to be with your child to help your child get that miracle? And we are seeing a huge increase in the number of families leaving their homes, having to leave their jobs, use up their 401k, their sick pay, all in order to get their child's miracle. And so that's where, that's where we live, is a lot in the hospitals, working with those families, trying to move them directly from the hospital bed into permanent housing, bypassing shelter altogether. And then something I think that we share in common, we see these moms leaving the delivery rooms and not being able to go back to their single adult room or with a baby or don't have family members that can take them in with a child. And so working to bring in uh, with our Baby's Best Start program, moms with children inside, allowing them that time to bond with their baby, to nurture, and then continue on their journey to housing. And then with children, we're seeing the effects of the pandemic, isolation that they faced in COVID, the anxiety, the night terrors, the trauma of leaving um, their homes and coming into shelter. Shelter in itself is so traumatic for families and wanting to address those behavioral health needs. And then on top of that, we have two multi-generational families. Many children are living with granny or auntie, and they're the ones that are coming into shelter. We've had great grandmas raising their great grandkids in shelter and just wanting to make sure that they have the resources and the support. But as Janice said, everything Janice said, we see in shelter not being, you know, it's hard when you're 70 trying to care for your two-year-old or your three-year-old, but you're going to make it happen because it's the right thing to do for you, and we want to be supportive there. So. Those are just some of the things that we're seeing. Janice, um, women of color, especially black women, experience homelessness at disproportional rates. Why is that? And uh, what do we need to do to address it? Well. And be, be real, because yes. I know you will. I can't be nothing about that. But uh, <laughs> what I say about that is that racism is on the top of all of this. We can't forget that. We can put all everything else we want to say and put in front of it, but race has all to do with black women not being able to get a home, keep a home, and sustain their families. What we can do about it, we got to do a lot of talking. We all in here have friends. We all have groups. We got to talk about our biases. We got to get ourselves educated around what it is and what we think about black people. What do we, what, what are the conversations we're having about them? What is it that we've made up? What is it that we've been taught growing up back in the day, years back? Grandmothers done taught us, aunties done taught us about black people. We wear a jacket when we out there and I call it a jacket because black women going for the same house as a white woman going from the same house with the same situations, criminal background, credit messed up, have the same amount of kids because there's this thing around black women have a bunch of kids. But you could have the same scenario with a white woman and that white woman will get the place before the black woman will. We got to sit with that. We need to talk about that a little bit more. That's real. That is so real. I see it every day. I challenge landlords. I'm going to call you on your stuff. With all due respect, I'm going to bring it to the table, figure out how I can help you to, through some things. But we have to know the reason why black women and families can't get ahead is because we have built a jacket put on us, stereotypic ideals about what we are, where we've been, and what we can and cannot do. We have to stop that conversation. That's right. Educate yourselves. <laughs> Educate yourselves. It's important that we do. I sit at all kind of tables with all different folks that don't look like me. And I feel like we all family. That's why I get to tell you the truth, <laughs> right? I get to tell you the truth because we're in this together. I want us all to win. 
In order for us all to win, we got to lift some folks up that's behind. So I leave you with thinking about anytime you're in a conversation, I've always said that I want to get to one of these Seahawks games and be on the podium and talk about, challenge all those thousands of people in the, in the, in the audience around who has a house, who's willing to give someone a second chance, who's willing to work with agencies like the YWCA and Mary's Place to be able to make sure that families are inside and can make it. Who is out there that can help pay for retention services to make sure people stay in their homes? Take that challenge, get with your friends, talk about your biases, and be true to yourselves. Be true to what it is. Get some reading going on. Go talk to some people. Do some things like that. Because everybody around me, I'm going to challenge. I'm going to challenge them all the way in terms of what we can do as a society to help move families forward. Mm. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, let's, I've always appreciated how, how really you have been on this subject and I think now more than ever, um, your voice is so important there. Yeah. And, and thank you for challenging. I mean, I think what you've said is, yeah, let's get the Seahawks. Let's yes. all go to the stadium. Fill it up and tell everyone that we, we do. We need right. everyone to get involved. That's right. right. Janice said so. <laughs> um, um, you know, the pandemic was hard for everybody. Um, there were, there were um, incredible challenges, um, both health and economic. Um, but I think when it comes to homelessness, there were also some bright spots. Marty, talk a little bit about um, how, how Mary's Place um, looked at the pandemic and how maybe that's changed some of your approach. Yeah, I, there were bright spots. I will say that there were silver linings in the way that we do service delivery. And 85% of the guests at Mary's Place identify as black, indigenous, or from communities of color. And that is wrong. And that should be mind blowing to you with the statistics that we have here in King County. And so we began to look at that, and it was our community that came up, and we at started to center our guests more, ask them what they needed, wanted to make sure that they were informing the process. We had done that uh, much before that, but it was important now to elevate voice, to give opportunity. And it was our community that came together to make sure that we had the supplies. You couldn't get a mask for a child or a family member. Um, they were, you know, do you remember at the beginning, uh, you know, people were making masks, but we couldn't get a child's mask, anything like that. It was our community that came together to, to provide that toilet paper when we were all running out. It was, I mean, those things when you're in shelter or in housing and you're trying to deliver those to families, those weren't available to our families. Um, but I will say some of the most important things I think that came out of it is what Janice alluded to is how do we keep families in their homes in the first place? And that was the first time during the pandemic that we saw rental assistance from our federal government become available. And when it was distributed, it worked, right? And it was important to see that you can keep families in their homes. And our, the African Community Housing Development Organization is here tonight. And I want to say they distributed about $38 million of that money to families in this community and an incredible gift. So thank you for what you did. But what that showed was it's possible, it does work, that families don't have to flood into shelters, that we can reduce those racial disparities by showing who ends up by keeping families in their home in the first place, reducing that trauma on children. And what we, what we believe is that you can have a generational impact if children can stay with their families in their homes today, tonight, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I think that has transformed the way we want to look at the system and what we want to do going forward. We believe you should lead with prevention resources for everybody that's calling on that intake line, every family you meet with, and ask them what it would take to stay in their homes. I will tell you, the math and the data tell you that it works, that it's more cost effective. Just take a 90 day stay in shelter for a family of about, we do an average size family, which is about 3.5. Um, is about $25,000. The cost to keep uh, a family in their home with that little brief assistance and some follow-up stability support is about $10,500. And look at the difference in the impact that you see and what you can do to change that. 
It's that data, those best practices that we're learning about across the nation that are, can transform th this work here in King County. I love that. Uh, you know, I think we often say the least expensive and least traumatic yeah. way to address our homelessness crisis is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And we showed we could do that. Um, Janice, um, you know, the, the community is frustrated because they don't see any progress in homelessness. If you're just an average person who isn't in this every day, how do you respond to that? Well, I call it outsiders looking in. Um, because there's a lot of work being done. And government can't do it by themselves. And we are often good liberals here in Washington State that uh, can pick things apart uh, around what they feel should be happening, um, but not getting involved. Uh, you need to get involved. You can't sit back and throw bricks and say, no, no, what are you doing? What are you doing with the money? What's happening? There is a lot going on behind the scenes. And you know, I think about homelessness, and one thing about it, it's not just getting a home. I call it the ingre ingredients of a cake. There are a lot of things involved in someone getting a home. Just putting them in a home don't mean they're going to stay there. You got drug addiction. You got mental health. You got all of these things that people are grappling with. If we don't address those particular things, how are people going to stay in a home? You can get them and put them in a home. Yeah, that's, that's fine, and check the box. They're in there, but will they stay there? You have a lot of permanent supportive housing that we have uh, case managers working on those, and we're trying to keep people in the home. We have an uh, epidemic of drugs now, the fentanyl crisis, things of that nature that families, single adults are all using behind the door. So it's one thing to say, get housing, but we need a full wraparound support type thing. Our mental health system has crashed here in Washington State. So it's not only affecting adults now, it's with our children. So in order it to be successful with it all, we're going to need all of those entities. We're going to need the mental health. We're going to need, you know, the case managers. We're going to need the drug addiction folks. All of those particular pieces we're going to need in order to impact housing. And I want the community to know that in order for us to be successful, we need you. Don't throw stones. Figure out how you can help. Walk into the mayor's office, figure out what you can do. Get some of your friends together, figure out what house you can build. Do those type of things. Before you talk about what they're not doing, get involved, then you can say what they're not doing. But until then, there's nothing you can say. I talk about us great liberals here in Washington State. There's a lot of them. We got a lot of work to do, too. Can't sit back and read the newspaper and say, oh, what the mayor's not doing, what those agencies are not doing. They are wasting money. Well, that's not the truth. That's not the truth. Come by, feed someone at Angeline's. Come by, give, give some things that they need, soaps and things that they need to, to, to keep the program running diapers, wipes, those type of things that we need to continue to work with families. So I just have to say that there's a lot going on, and it's deeper than you think. It's going to take more than Mary's place in the YWCA to fix this problem, and the government. Just think how many thousands of dollars and how many manpower we would have if we had everybody in that Seahawks stadium doing something doing something, not talking about doing it, do it. I love that. OK, I've got a couple of questions, and you're going to give me two-word responses. I know this is going to be hard. Two-word. Two word. Mm -hmm. That's hard for me, okay. I'll get it. I know. I'll try. 
What motivates you and gives you hope? Marty. <laughs> Guests and frontline staff. Nice. Jeez. Mm. I'm going to say hope and accountability. Ooh, I love it. Uh, two words again. If you had a magic wand to solve homelessness, what would you do? You know that stadium I was just talking about? Seahawks. <laughs> no. Uh, I think, you know, we just have to all get in here and do it together. Do it together. Love it. Community and um, prevention. Community and prevention. Thank you both. Um, we are going to take some questions from the audience, um, but first we have a, a really special guest, um, Anna Patrick, a reporter with the Seattle Times Project Homeless is here. Um, and I think she's got some questions, um, but you all should get your questions um, ready, so be thinking about them. These women are brilliant. Um, and if folks are online, they can put their questions in the chat. Hi, everyone. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm going to just ask two quick questions, not to take up all of the question time. Um, my first question, um, both of my questions will be for both of you. First question is, I think often when you think about women in homelessness, we end up talking about family homelessness. So I wanted to ask you, um, when it comes to single adult women, what do you think we're not considering in terms of their needs? What's missing from that particular subpopulation in terms of like the, the, the discussion or the focus? Or you know, in some ways, are they being overlooked? My honest opinion, they're not being overlooked. I do think there are a lot of resources out here for single adults. Um, I do think if you want to just narrow it down, mental health and drug addiction help is what is needed for single adult women. But I do think, I often say, again, I have a big mouth and I'm at a lot of tables, uh, that we do have a crisis around single adults being homeless. And Marty and myself are and is involved with a lot of that. And we're always pushing the envelope because we tend to think families isn't in that equation because they're not laying out on the streets with their children. But if you want to just narrow it down, I would really say that mental health and drug addiction help is really what a lot of our single women need. I would say I would concur with that, um, exactly what they need. But I would say, in addition to that, finding that sense of community and belonging, because the isolation and the trauma and the grief and the pain and the loss that these women have been through is so great. And they tend to think that their needs aren't worthy. But we want to remind them that their needs are the most wonderful, beautiful part of who they are. And to have a place to come and belong and get their needs met and sometimes that means making a friend and meeting others that are in the same situation you are because you are too proud to reach out to family, because you're too embarrassed to talk about the children that you had to give up, because you are struggling with depression that you never had before and you don't know where to turn. There are so many, you're a senior woman whose son just left you off at the doorstep because he couldn't keep you in your home because the landlord said someone got to go. And those are what we're seeing. And so having a place to belong, a place where you can find dignity and to take a shower and get a warm cup of coffee and a hug, those are the places that we need while we have those other supportive services in place because you can't get out of homelessness by yourself. OK, thank you both. Uh, one more quick question. And because we're focused on women and homelessness, I just wanted to ask about, uh, so when you look at the numbers, the majority of people who are homeless in King County are men. In 2020, 56% uh, of folks surveyed in our point in time count were men. Um, 
I'm curious to get your thoughts. Because our homelessness system is primarily serving men, do you think that our system in some ways is it adequately meeting the needs of women? Or do you think that there are things that we could do better in terms of how we prioritize the needs of women? Good question. You know, um, that is true, what you're saying. It often just irritates me a lot around when we're talking about it, they bring up the men. No disrespect, men. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 there are a lot of women out here uh, that really need the type of support that we're talking about. And I do know Angelines is all, all women, women that are down there. And I know, you know there's a couple mixed shelters. But you're right about that. I do think there's really you find that a lot of women don't want to be mixed with the men. Mm -hmm. um, they want to be in a women's shelter. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of that. I think we could get more of that mm -hmm. to be able to help women feel safe. Mm -hmm. We talk about the encampments and we talk about women in the encampments. I do think part of that not being safe, knowing where to go, um, not having a place of their own, as Marty just talked about, I do think we do need to find more safe spaces for women. You have a lot of women that have been raped, um, domestic violence, uh, and don't feel safe going in places. So, you know, the more we can make of that, the more we can find space for women to be able to thrive, get dignity, be able to talk about their trauma, their space, what has brought them where they are today, I think that would be a good thing. If you wanna, yeah, that, I think that would be something that we should look at adding. Thank you, thank you. I, I agree with Janice and I will say that, you know, that's how Mary's Place was founded, right? A group of women, or a little firecracker, Korean Presbyterian minister collecting women on the street, right? Because they had nowhere to go 30 years ago and didn't feel a sense of belonging. Wanted to create that sense of home for them. Um, and that hasn't changed. And yet you saw in the pandemic, a huge spike in partner violence. You couldn't stay home and stay healthy. You waited until your partner passed out or went to bed and you left and fled with the family you stood, or your children, you stood outside in the freezing cold calling for help. And what did you find? Most of our domestic violence shelters have closed and there is no room at the end for anyone. And so that safety and that sense of safety is real. And that is what we're seeing with moms, with children, that they want a place to go. And oftentimes if there's a, you know, families uh, or shelters with that accept men, they don't wanna go to that shelter. And we ourselves even had to close a smaller women only shelter with children uh, during the pandemic because we couldn't social distance. And so adding those beds back, being intentional about the housing we build, that maybe there are some just for single moms with children or single women. I know Plymouth has been working on that as well. We just moved, I think, 15 women from mm -hmm. the Mary's Place Day Center into housing uh, at their property. So I think there's a lot that can be done, but you know, it starts with um, helping a woman regain that dignity and that sense of safety and trust. And you have to have a place to do that where you feel safe. Thank you both. In terms of questions, Jeff, yeah. Oh, there's a microphone in the back. So yeah, feel free to line up. Good Hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> now? Yes. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> I'm Dr. Raul Garcia. I, um, my wife and I started a non-for-profit organization for positive change in Washington called Opportunity for Washington. And uh, first, I want to thank you. Um, Denise, I'm, I'm an emergency physician. So mm -hmm. I have held a child for two weeks in my ER because mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go mm -hmm. in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. Right, and one of the things that we have really 
keen on lately is the fact that hospitals are closing down women's services, OBGYN, around the state because it's a losing proposition. So you've hit it on, on the nose with mental health mm -hmm. and drug addiction, I wanna thank you. And Marty, your sense of community, I think that if we could have a meeting like this every night mm -hmm. in every corner of the city, then maybe we could be heard. Uh, so thank you for that. My question is, is there room to form a coalition of non-for-profits together? Maybe they do 10% for this topic in this non-for-profit. Maybe the other one does 5%. But to get them all interested, to have um, a coalition center where we could pick up percentages of those non-for-profits that are willing to help in this issue and help the community, help the government resolve this because it's getting bigger and so let's end it. Let's, let's, let's fight hard. I would say absolutely. We have different coalitions, but serving uh, together with a wider perspective of providers like yourself coming from you know, from medicine to education to uh, homeless services to the faith community, just different representatives to come together to have these conversations and to elevate voice is, is something that we've dreamed of, right? And there's power in the people in bringing those voices and those platforms forward because without change at um, the state level, the federal level, we're not going to create what's needed and it won't trickle down to build more shelter, to build more housing, to build the, the supports to keep uh, women's clinics open or build more uh, behavioral health, mental health. So um, we, I love the idea. It's something that we've talked about. We have a you know homeless providers coalition, but it needs to be much bigger and much broader. More people at the table, and who needs to be at those tables to elevate voice? Bring it on! I'm ready. Yeah. Bring it on! Love it. Let's go to the next one. Hello. Um, so. This question is for both of you, but Marty, at the beginning you mentioned we we're gonna talk a lot about prevention. In terms of keeping people in their homes for a little bit longer versus having people go to shelters, I would love to hear like logistically, hearing too about abuse and people who are in unsafe situations. How do you help in that moment? How do you try to extend someone's stay in their current home in a healthy and safe way? And then also, how do we all help with that? Yeah, I love that. You know, and I think uh, Janice alluded to that too. It's that stability support, right? You go in, you can't just provide the dollars to keep somebody in their home. They're, they know what they need. And when you sit down and have the real conversations, families know what they know the direction they want to go. They know they, what they need to do, but they don't always have the resources. And so having those honest conversations and the deep listening of what they need and being able to provide that and being able to have them a place to call where they'll check in, not when they're at the end of the rope and they have the eviction notice or they're standing outside in the pouring rain with all of their belongings, but before that. You know, how can you expand that intake line to take calls for people that are looking even for prevention resources or that stability support and making that connection to the mental health provider that we know has space um, and where they can go to drop in and get those services. There's so much more we can do to embrace the community and offer those uh, stability supports and we believe it's possible and doable. We know it will take all of us, but we have to keep the family and those individuals with lived experience at the center and then surround them with this area of support and it has to be a public-private partner. Partnership. We will never get there relying on one or the other. It's bringing them both together, utilizing the wisdom, the knowledge, the expertise of how we can do this better together. And I say again, we here in Washington, we're very uh, pro proactive. Well, we're not proactive, we're really reactive. And so if we could get in the proactive space that we take all of our learnings, because we've been doing this a long time, we should know what it takes to do what we need to do. This isn't a new conversation. 
we keep saying it over and over and over and over again. And they keep taking it from the shelf, bringing it back, taking it from the shelf, bringing it back. And I'm like, where's the action? Mm -hmm. I'm tired of hearing the same thing. So we have to do a better job because we can do that here. We, we, we have the where to go, what to do. We have some great people here that could get together, as you talked about, and let's get some things in order. Not let, not let it fall down, and then here we come. To get a grant, it have, you have to be reactive. You have to get evicted to get the money. And improve that, you need to get the money, but you need the form to say that you have the 14, 30-day day to be evicted if you don't do what you need to do. As Marty says, we need to get more proactive. We need to be able to go in a lot earlier. We need to be able to work with landlords to be able to help them understand what they're going through. And landlords want help. I, landlords are bruised. I'm not even gonna talk about that moratorium. But I do think that there are issues around why landlords don't want to take a second chance. They're not partnering with agencies that can go in and do things they can't do. Agencies can go into a place at 12 o'clock midnight. Landlords can't. They got to get the notice and pin it on the door and tell them they're coming and all that. Nonprofits don't have to do that in terms of working in case management. So partnering with landlords to be able to work with people to keep them housed. We often go to court. We often talk about working with landlords, trying to figure out what we can do to better help the family stay housed. What's going on that we can kind of keep them in place? Sometimes it's not the money. It's the mental health. It's the drug addiction. It's the traffic coming in and out. So being proactive rather than reactive is where we need to get to. I love Thank that. You. And you know, the final thing I'll say on that is every one thing that every one of us can do is be involved in advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is only one in five people who are income eligible for uh, a housing voucher or rental assistance, even before the pandemic, receive it. And that is because Congress hasn't allocated enough funds. That is true in Democratic administrations and Republican administrations, and it has to change. So the, the, the ability for us to all come together, um, as both of these incredible leaders have talked about, um, starts in a number of ways. We can all call our elected officials. We can all make sure we're voting for people who uphold these values and believe that every single person should have access to a healthy, decent, affordable home. Um, and you can volunteer and donate to these incredible organizations. Um, thank you all so much for, for the conversation. Thank you for the oh, leadership. Thank you. The work thank you for... all do every single day. Oh, right back at um, you. Yeah. And um, we'll all be around um, during the break. Um, and then um, Alicia will be coming back up um, for our second half. So thank you all. Grab a bite. Have a all drink. Right. Thank you. And let's fill up Seahawks Stadium. Yeah. I was really looking to up my self-care. And then when I started looking at doing that through beauty and personal care, I noticed that there was a discrepancy in how products were marketed to black women compared to other bigger markets. I wasn't seeing black women in the clean beauty space owning companies. I know we're out there, but we just don't have the platforms, you know, we're a lot of kitchen makers and things like that. So I started my business in my own kitchen, making for myself, and I just decided to share it with the world one day. My name is Angela Brown, and my business is Brown Angel Skin and Hair, a plant-based clean beauty product line that features vintage black actresses on the labels. This is Catherine Boyd from The Flying Ace. I really wanted to distinguish myself from other brands, and I was like, wow, this is a great way to combine two things that I really enjoy, natural skincare and hair care ingredients, and films from early 20th century that were written, directed, produced, and distributed to and for black audiences. I decided to pair a different actress with a different aroma for the different products that I was making. 
And it became really, really interesting because I was able to uncover black actresses that a lot of people didn't know about. My business is a micro business and I was concerned about taking that risk to get this new concept out. And so that's one of the main things that the Comcast Rise Grant has given me is an opportunity to take that risk and to try to scale up my business and take it to the next level. I feel that my business not only helps increase representation for queer black women as entrepreneurs, it also helps increase representation for black women on the shelf. The different business services connected to the Comcast Rise Grant came just in time. There's an online community of other entrepreneurs. There's all kinds of marketing services, classes that I can take. So I'm really excited about really stepping up my game as an entrepreneur and learning more from professionals. I'm going to be able to do so many things that I wouldn't be able to do in this moment if I didn't have something like the Comcast Rise Grant. Welcome back, everybody, to the second half of Civic Cocktail. You enjoy, hopefully you enjoyed the first segment. <laughs> so, so informative. Well, I love the next segment we're about to do, but first, please indulge what I'm about to do. Um, and I already told the audience that something's going to happen, so this impacts all of you that are actually in the live audience. I bought these new pair of glasses called Ray-Ban Stories. And so they're like the cooler version of what Google Glass was supposed to be. So I can put them on and like record people. So I want, the, I want to record what people see, what I see out to you. Is that cool? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's good. You all look great. You should want people to know what you look like. <laughs> so, it, so indulge me. Turn it on. Mm -hmm. I wear my sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see if it works. And okay. Oh wait, hold on. Hey, Facebook, record video. Okay. Say hi, uh, Marilyn. Hi. <laughs> Say hi, Facebook. <laughs> Wonderful crowd. <laughs> hey, Facebook, stop recording. Mm. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That is not a promotional placement. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's the voice command. I can't change it. Sorry. But as we were, thank you so much for indulging me. Thank you so much. <laughs> The, we're going to talk with Marilyn Morgan. Now, here's the thing. I've already had the pleasure of doing this once already during Black History Month. And I, we had such a great conversation up at the Edmonds Bookstore about this. And I was like, I have to have her here for Women's History Month as well. Because I learned so much. And so many of you in the room that are watching love history. You love Seattle history. You like women's history. And her book, which her new book, Trailblazing mm -hmm. Black Women, and Washington State is an amazing, easy read. Believe it or not, this relatively thin book is 29 chapters, 29. 28. Eight. Eight. Is it eight? Yeah. <laughs> so 29. But, it's, but they're nice bite-sized mm. chapters, and it leaves you wanting more. And I think those are the best kind of books where it makes you want to go back and do more research and to mm -hmm. learn more. And one of the things I really loved about this book, too, is that when we think about history, we think past. And there are a handful of people in this book that are still with us today. Yeah. So that's what made it really impactful for me. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Marilyn Morgan. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here with you today. <laughs> well, first, just I want to ask you, what inspired you to write this particular book? Well. There were several things. Um, so many, when I was going to school, in high school or junior high school, I never got the opportunity to learn about uh, black women and their contributions to uh, American society. I mean, of course, I knew who Rosa Parks was, and I knew who Harriet Tubman was. Uh, but I never got to learn about women like Bessie Coleman, the first African-American woman to get her pilot's license, 
and the first American to get her international pilot's license, or women like Maggie Walker, who's from my home state of Virginia, and she established the first black person to establish her own um, commercial bank. And she established it back in like 1903. And it was still in existence until the late 80s, early 90s. And so I kept thinking, and then I saw the movie Hidden Figures. Anybody see that movie? And I was just astounded that I didn't know who those women were in the movie. You know, they were three women, black women mathematicians who made a vital contributions to the space program. And I started to thinking, these women are all over the place. And I don't want to call them ordinary, but they're unsung. You know, they, they make these contributions and they don't get their due. And to me, history is incomplete because you never know about them. No, thank you for that, and I can totally relate. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about a handful of chapters um, mm -hmm. in the book tonight. And you know, the first couple of chapters um, that we're going to talk about resonated with me both personally and professionally, since City, Seattle City Club itself was founded by eight club women. Mm -hmm. And you refer to, the, to that word club woman in yeah. the book a lot. Yeah. Um, tell us more about chapter four, which is the Washington State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Well, you know, my mother was a club woman a club woman, and as a, a little girl, I always wanted to be a club woman. And, uh, you know, I thought it was the coolest thing. And uh, club women go back to slavery in the African-American community. You know, there were always women who were getting together, thinking of ways to improve the lives of children and the women in whatever community they found themselves in. So the Washington State Association of Colored Women's Clubs um, was just such a club. You know, they were founded in 1927, and, no, 1917. And um, their, their, their saying or their motto was, today we are for United Service. And they were an advocacy service organization. And they advocated for, you know, the education, um, the care of the elderly in the black population. And um, they did a lot to try to help women uh, become more self-sufficient since they were kind of left sometimes with being the breadwinner and so there was a lot of programs that they had uh, for training and, um, and even in simple things like um, sewing and cooking because those skills, if you were really good at them, you could use those to, to make an income. And they were also a political force, you know. Uh, they got out the vote, they got people to register, uh, so at conventions, a lot of political candidates came to their conventions to speak because they knew these women could get out the vote. And so, harking back to the last segment about do something, these women did something. You know, it might not have seemed like a great, grandiose thing, but it was something to keep life moving forward. And so, I I, I love club women. They are, you know, kind of like the backbone. And, you know, for all women, I think, you know, clubs are really big for women of all races, uh, like from the late 1800s, probably up through the 70s until women became, uh, you know, immersed in the workforce. And I want to say the Washington State of Color Women's Club is still in existence today still active. Uh, I think the Tacoma chapter is probably one of the, the most active. But I want to say they also led protests like Dr. Nettie Ashbery, who's like a kind of an iconic civil rights uh, activist in um, Tacoma, uh, led a protest against that uh, film, uh, Birth of a Nation. 
And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this film, but it was released in 1915. And it had these horrible descriptions of black people. And so she led a protest to keep the movie out of Seattle. And the movie actually did premiere in Seattle, but it only um, ran for a week because of her protests. So they got things done, I guess is what I'm saying in a roundabout way. Yeah. Well, speaking of that club, and again, I loved, I, that's, I learned about that club from reading your book. Yeah. I had no idea that it existed. Uh, but speaking of, the, of the, the Federation, you dedicate a chapter in your book, chapter 12, if you're following along at home, um, to their second president, Jeannie Samuels. In fact, you call, you call her a pioneering club woman. She was. She was immersed in club woman activities. Um, she, um, at the 1920 convention, she had like a, a, a very ambitious agenda. She wanted to address the plight of the elderly in the community, the plight of children, uh, the need for education of our children. Um, like I said, the mayor of Everett, she was an Everett native. The mayor of Everett uh, came and he was also, I think, uh, a candidate who was gonna run for governor. And the Everett Herald covered the event and they called it uh, an exceptional event. So she had a lot of um, exhibits there were um, discussions on the lives of civil rights icon like Frederick Douglass. And um, I'd like to read a little something from one of her quotes. Um, She said, it is our duty as representative of the colored people of the state to do all in our power to assume our true position in the life of the nation and to break down a barrier of misunderstanding of the colored people, she said. In this work, our churches and clubs should take an active part. And uh, she also said that in a cookbook published by the WACW, Thank God that we have something to do, whether we like it or not. Doing our duty brings out the best that is in us and will breed in us self-control, the strength of will, cheerfulness, and content, and a score of virtues which idleness fails to give. And so their home was always uh, full of activity. You know, there were always uh, rallies, uh, she worked to guide and help women become better in their professions. Uh, you know, she had workshops on uh, bookkeeping, um, clerical work, uh, hat making, and as I said, also for what people might consider non-professional work like sewing and cooking and laundry, because those were essential um, work fields during that time. And so she was a woman who did things. She would do something. And her house was also um, listed in the Green Book. And anybody see the movie Green Book? <laughs> Good, you, know, you see as many movies as I do. But the Green Book was published in 1936, I think. And I think it only stopped publication in 1969. And so if you saw the movie, you know that the book lists safe places where black travelers could stay or shop or get their hair done. And I was amazed to see that her house is listed as one of the safe places where black travelers could, could stay. And her house is still in existence. If you're ever in uh, Everett, uh, you can drive by and it's still looks pretty much like it does in the book. And so I just love this picture on the back. This is a picture of the 1920 uh, convention. And you see all of these lovely ladies. And at the convention, I wanna point out that there were 2,000 <clears throat> women who uh, crowded the Everett High School. 
and they represented uh, 120 uh, chapters of the club from around the state of Washington. And so a lot of that had to do with her. She was very active club woman. That's incredible. Like I, it's, yeah, like I've never seen them. I wanted to see the movie. Yeah. But it was like to find out, you know, to see it hit so close to home. Yeah. To know that, you know, oh, I probably drove by this house all the time. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and now you're going to go and look at it. You can't talk about trailblazing women in this region without looking at the workforce, specifically Boeing. Yeah. Um, in chapter 11, odd numbers, <laughs> uh, <laughs> showcases several women who helped break the color barrier line when Boeing hired the black road the river. Tell us about the three women you highlight in this chapter. Well, you know, the one thing that's unique about this book that I think is that uh, I was able to go and find old interviews that were done with these women. A lot of the women in the book, the Washington Legacy Project, I think, has started interviewing uh, Washington's shakers and movers. I think dating back, you know, they might have started in the 1970s. And Mohai did a series on Rosie's, and three of the women here, um, uh, I was able to, to read their interviews. And, um, you know, I used to work at Boeing, and my time there was lovely. But, you know, my passion has always to be a full-time writer. So I left to, uh, as my family politely puts it, to pursue poverty. <laughs> and uh, and um, and so these women, Katie Burks, um, Vivian Lane, and Katrina, Catherine Tompkins, I really related to them. They were the first wave of black women to come into work at Boeing, and it's hard to believe that Boeing had a racial exclusion exclusion policy, uh, but they did. And uh, from 1939 to 1942, the company uh, fought very hard not to hire any people of color. And so finally they relented, and these were uh, the first wave of black women to come in. And me, um, talk about keeping your biases in check. Well, when I first uh, started uh, researching their stories, my heart was beating, and I was like, boy, these ladies are in for it. But surprisingly, they enjoyed their time at Boeing for the most part. And I relate to them because they were all from small towns. Uh, Catherine, Kathy, um, Katie and Vivian are sisters, and they were from Birmingham, Alabama. And Catherine uh, is from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they all said the same thing. They always, as soon as they graduated from high school, they always dreamed of uh, traveling. And I come from a very small town in Virginia, and that was also my dream. <laughs> I always wanted to, to travel the world. And all of them said that they looked at a map and they saw Seattle and they figured that was the furthest part, <laughs> that was the furthest place away from where they were. And um, the ladies uh, worked on the line to make uh, airplanes. And, you know, for the most part, you know, they um, were part of the, the program from President uh, Roosevelt Franklin, the work, um, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt, the work program that he had. And, um, and they rode a train for like four days to get to Seattle. And, um, you know, when they first came, they were put in dorms. And uh, the two sisters, you know, they stayed together throughout their, their lives in Seattle. But when they first came, um, they didn't know what to expect. But, um, they said that they were treated well, and as long as they did their work, their supervisors had no problem with them. But there was um, 
uh, Burke said, you know, everyone from my shop was from a different state, and I enjoyed getting to know and talking to everyone, especially this woman from Germany. She was very interesting, very smart, and I learned a lot from her. And as for the work environment, she said, primarily she worked with women because most men, you know, were serving in the war. I think because I was young, most of the people were nice to me. And I think everyone just wanted to work together to get the planes out. I was a fast worker, so I think they liked my work. And uh, however, there was little quirks adjusting to Seattle. Uh, she said many restaurants around town initially did not want the black workers at their establishment. Uh, we didn't care that much because we loved going to Canada when we had time off. So, you know, I think that was probably a good deal. But she said that uh, she had great supervisors, and as long as she did her work, they had no problem with her, and they were often protective of the black workers from bad situations. So she gave uh, an example that um, the company had hired a bunch of high school students uh, who began calling her name and using foreign language. And she said, you know, I stood up for myself. I went and told my supervisor what they had said and they were fired. And, um, and so I was pleasantly surprised that the supervisors really looked out for them and protected them. And Vivian Lane said much of the same thing. Um, she received a promotion to hydraulic panel, panels. And I guess they had started out as riveters or manufacturing. And so uh, she said that's where she experienced prejudice. There was a group of people from Montana who worked in that area. They didn't want to work with me because I was black, she said. Their attitudes didn't bother uh, Lane. She said she was there to do a job. However, she drew the line when those uh, workers became verbally abusive. They would say to me that I had a tail and that all black people had tails. I will never forget that. The supervisor, Josephine Ryan, said, you're not going to talk to that girl like that. I have a daughter about her age. Lane said Ryan was very forceful. Um, they never bothered me again. It wasn't a shock to me, but I wasn't bothered because I always knew I was a person. And so um, happy to see that an 18-year-old has so much esteem that she fights back, and those words did not uh, mar her in any way. And so I guess the other thing that was uh, different in their uh, work at Boeing was that um, you either had to belong to the union or have a work permit to work there. And uh, the black workers could not join the union. And um, the union to join was $1.50. The work permits were $3. And so they tried to form their own black union, but unfortunately, the company shut that down. And so um, they, Tompkins uh, was trained as a welder, uh, but she was placed in a lot of departments, and she said that she loved working all over you know, the, the plant. And she worked as a forklift driver. And uh, she said, luckily I could drive. I really like working the forklift. I drove all over the plant and it was fun. Um, building a plane was not like it is today. It was like making a cake. During World War II, you started from scratch. And um, so those are just a few quotes from these women that I found very interesting. And um, so during their time off, they spent a lot of time going to uh, functions at the Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
they spent a lot of time going to USO functions where all three of them met their husbands. Yes. <laughs> that is, is I was think when I was reading that chapter, I couldn't figure out what resonated with me the most, but I think you said it for me where if anyone if I've ever told anyone my my travel story when like I grew up in Detroit. And they're like, how did you end up in Silicon Valley of all places? And I said, I wanted to go the furthest I can go without hitting water. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I didn't know about Seattle at the time. I only knew about California. So it probably would have been Seattle if yeah. I had known more about Seattle. Um, mm. So one more that I would like for us to talk about, because we have to get ready to wrap up. We've talked about club women. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the social aspect. We talked about the workforce aspect. But of course, Seattle is ranked number one as the most real red city in America. So there's no wonder that several of the women featured in your book has an educational connection. Um, can you briefly share with us about Dorothy Hollingsworth? Yeah, I like to honor Dorothy Hollingsworth. She recently passed at 101. And um, if you don't know, she was the first black woman elected to the Seattle School Board. And she was the first uh, director of the Head Start program under President Johnson. And um, so she moved here in 1949. She had uh, six years of teaching experience back in South Carolina. And in 1947, the Seattle School Board had hired its first black uh, teacher, Thelma DeWitty. And so when she applied, she said the school board told her um, that Seattle has hired its first Negro teacher and, it, and it's not ready to hire more. And so she was disappointed, but she said, you know, she tells, has often told her students, don't let one disappointment, you know, stop you. Keep on plugging. And she did. Uh, she was not deterred by um, the rejection, and um, even though she had a hard time finding the job, she did land on her feet. But she did, you know, begin to to learn uh, Seattle. Um, I think she said that, you know, where she's from, you know, you know where not to go and where to go. But here, there was no signs that said white only or you know black only. Uh, you just had to do a trial and error, which I guess she said that um, in 1946, she and her husband, Ralph Hollingsworth, uh, who was stationed at um, Fort Lewis, um, and you know they moved here to Seattle. And they thought it would give them a good start, but um, so one day they went over to, um, she said, there wasn't as much integration as I thought it would be. Housing had pockets where blacks lived. I expected that we would all be one. I was surprised, but I wasn't overwhelmed by it. For instance, she said she went over to Port Orchard one day with her husband and went into a restaurant and asked for a Coke. The manager said, I could sell it to you, but you can't drink it here. So I began to think to myself, you may have come a long way from home, but the practice isn't that much difference. And so she landed on her feet and she got a job as a social worker for the Seattle Public Schools. And um, she had gone to the University of Washington to get her master's degree. And um, when she started working as a social worker, um, she became a legendary advocate for the kids and so she said, like, she had one kid who was constantly, um, you know, coming to her office. So she went to the teacher and asked, you know, what's wrong? And the teacher said, she fights every day. And she said, why? And the teacher said, um, she fights because they call her the N-word. And I said to her, that's all right because that's a term of endearment in the South. So Hollingsworth was appalled by the teacher's response. I'm sure you upset the child. That's not a term of endearment. 
So I talked to the principal about teachers needing some human relation courses. And so she was a doer, and she got a lot of the human relation courses um, inducted into the Seattle school system. But in 1975, uh, she um, made history by being the first black woman to serve on the Seattle School Board. And again in 1979, when she was uh, elected president of the board, and uh, she served a six-year term, and it's historical in more than one way because for the first time, the black community um, thought, felt that they had a say in the education of their children. But she was tasked with the unthankless task of trying to desegregate schools. And so um, several things had failed. A volunteering had to go to another school had failed. And so they did the uh, controversial busing plan, uh, which I think nobody liked. And uh, I don't know how many of you lived through the, the busing of the schools, but yeah, I think it was pretty bad for everyone. One thing I will say, though, is that, you know, when I was reading that chapter and the other ones as well, when you talk about this from a historical perspective, we also go, this is happening now. Yeah. We're, we're still hearing the, those stories. We're mm -hmm. still seeing it happen in real time. And that was really one of the reasons why I wanted to have you here to talk about this book and some of the things that we were that was going on through it. Because it's like, what is the relevance? The relevance is that these are things are still happening. Yeah. These are still things that we can hopefully, as community members, weigh in on help change. And so this book is amazing. Thank you so much. I hate this, mm -hmm. this topic at this point. I, could just, I just love listening to you read. It's like, I'm like, and you always know it's going to get real when they put their glasses on and yeah. off. You're like, it's about to get real. So Marilyn, thank you so much. Please oh, give her a round you. of applause. <laughs> and again, so much in there. So please make sure that you join us here again, hopefully in person, um, also online as well. Um, for our next Civic Cocktail, which will be Wednesday, April the 5th, here at the Collective Seattle. Um, I am going to encourage all of you to register sooner than later, because we are going to do something really pretty special here. Um, we're going to be meeting, have a community conversation with the Seattle Kraken. Um, and they're going to talk about how they've been using their sports platform to, to um, do more and engage with the community more and do activities and that sort of thing. And they're actually going to be here with one of their community partners, Youth Care. So you definitely want to be here for that. And then the second half of that session is going to be about empowering girls and youth of color to enjoy sports and outdoors. So we'll have some folks from um, uh, Girls on the Run, Snohomish County, my neck of the woods. And also um, Allison Desir, you might know who she is, um, activist, runner, and author of Running Wild Black. So registration is open right now. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be some surprises along the way. And I guarantee you, you will have FOMO if you are not in the room. We might even be using that climbing wall over there, you guys. So. <laughs> And Jeff is a good climber, I'm telling you, it's, it's insane. So again, thank you so much. Thanks for supporting City Club. We are so grateful to all of you. Um, if you're enjoying our, our programming, please feel free to follow us online on all of our social channels and donate, because we are a nonprofit. Um, but again, thank you so much. Give yourselves a round of applause. And until then, we'll see you in a month. Take care.